I'd like to introduce Adrian Covert. Um, Adrian is a really busy person. I just want you all to know that it's about four o'clock his time out in California. Um, and he's been in meetings um, and has just come to help us out. Um, Adrian is Vice President of Public Policy for the San Francisco Bay Area Council, where he provides research and advocacy leadership on climate resilience policy and homelessness. And in 2015, Adrian was enjoying a Guinness uh, at San Francisco's oldest pub when he got into a debate with the bartender about which bar was the oldest in the city. Um, and from then on, he developed a fascination with the oldest bars in the cities, um, in cities, which culminated in his book, which was published in 2016. Um, and it is a combination of history and travel guide to the surviving taverns of the American of America's colonial era, and Adrian now lives in Santa Rosa, California, with his wife and son. So, Adrian, when you are ready. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sally. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, great. So thank you, Sally and Katina for inviting me um, to speak today. And big thanks to everyone who works at the Wayside Tavern Foundation for the invite. I love doing these talks. I love taverns. I love old bars. There's nothing better to keep you warm when it's cold outside, which I understand it is for you, not really for me but I wish it was because it would make it everything cozier. I will say that I have had both of the cocktails that uh, the gentleman bartender referred to in your video at the Wayfair Tavern. Both of them are great and it's a, a fantastic way to keep warm. So today with the talk, I wanted to talk about obviously taverns, specifically their role in colonial America and especially during the Revolutionary War um, and I'll end up with highlighting some of the surviving colonial era cocktail um, taverns that you can go visit today and a little bit about the history surrounding them. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I got involved in this subject. Uh, after all, I live in California, I've always lived in California. And until I wrote this book, I hadn't spent a whole lot of time on the East Coast. So as Sally mentioned, the idea for this book came about while I was enjoying a Guinness at San Francisco's oldest Irish pub, not its oldest pub in general, but we got into a discussion um, uh, about what the oldest bar is in the city. Um, and there was some debate about that. And then we started thinking, well, what's the oldest saloon in all of California? It has to probably date to the gold rush era. And then from there, we started talking about, well, I wonder what the oldest bar in America is. And that has to be on the original, uh, in one of the original 13 colonies. And I started um, mapping out a road trip to go visit the oldest bars in America. And I started looking for some sort of travel guide to take me there and teach me about the surviving taverns and uh, I was having a hard time finding this guide that I assumed existed. Um, and at the same time, I was reading a book by uh, author Christopher Hitchens, and it was a biography on Thomas Jefferson called Author of America. And at various points in Jefferson's story, he visits this place called the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, for a major pivotal point in Jefferson's professional development and also in the development of the United States leading up to the Revolutionary War when the Virginia House of Burgesses would be uh, dissolved by the royally appointed governor and Jefferson and Patrick Henry and George Washington would convene at the Raleigh to figure out what their next steps were going to be. Um, and at one point, the author of this book, Christopher Hitchens, breaks prose and says in parentheses, someone needs to write a book about the role of taverns in the American Revolution. And at that point, it kind of hits me that the search guide, the, the guidebook that I'm looking for, for surviving taverns doesn't really exist. Um, I should put one together. 
And I will say that there are some excellent books on colonial taverns by Kim Rice, by David Conroy, and others. And in the back of my book, there's several acknowledgments to these works about the role of taverns in colonial society um, and what taverns were like. But there wasn't one that brought that together along with a guide on what taverns are still around. A lot of this work focused on taverns that had long since been destroyed and have been lost to history. So I wanted to go on a road trip and, and string them all together and tell that story through the surviving taverns. So a friend of mine, I worked at a publishing agency, gave, gave him a call and, and we were off to the races. So my goal for this book was to create the most complete drinking and travel companion for America's surviving revolutionary taverns. And we started that journey by identifying each of the surviving pre-1800 taverns still standing with the caveat that they had to be operating as a tavern prior to 1800. After I published the book, I got a couple you know, angry emails from people saying that, hey, I've got a, a tavern that was built in 1740 and um, you didn't include me in your book. And I would say, I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the tavern? And it turned out to just have been someone's house until 1996 and they made it to a restaurant. So not what I was looking for. So again, looking for taverns, buildings that served as taverns prior to 1800. And let's see where they are today. So I'm going to share with you a slide that shows the map of what we came up or what I came up with. So let me pull this up. Hopefully I uh, can do this seamlessly. Does everyone see a map of all these teardrops? Um, I'm hoping it looks like a Google map that, that you all see. Um, and what you're looking at is the location of 171 pre-1800 taverns that still exist in the original 13 colonies. Most are in New England and the Mid-Atlantic region. All told, there are uh, 72 bars and restaurants. There are 49 museums, 36 inns, 12 community buildings, one Starbucks and one yoga studio as far as I can tell, last count. Uh, the book contains a state-by-state -state index on the location and current use of each tavern. And the color coordination of these teardrops show, uh, indicate different uses for the taverns today. And I know you might be thinking, oh my God, how did he visit all of those taverns? And confession, I didn't visit all of them. I did visit though, the 21 most consequential, most best preserved taverns um, that I felt were worthy of specifically highlighting in the book. And these are the ones that um, received some special recognition in the book, including Longfellow's Wayside Inn. So I'm going to stop sharing if I can. Hold on so I can go back. And of course, the mouse isn't cooperating. Okay, there we go. So, so let me talk a little bit about the taverns themselves. Uh, one of the most important things to remember talking about colonial taverns in this era is that the colonists themselves were land rich, but cash poor. And that meant a lot of their services lacked amenities that would be considered very basic today. Taverns were also considered, uh, were also often the only public building in town. Um, and because of that, they were considered what we might call critical infrastructure today, required by law in many, ta uh, in many colonies that they would have at least one tavern. These taverns were used for restaurants, and hotels most famously, but also they were commonly used as the town's only library, the bank, the hospital, general stores. They were used as courthouses, schools, jails, and brothels. And the diversity of 
purposes that were used in uh, that taverns um, were put to use for, I think is interestingly reflected in the diversity of language used for taverns. There are many, many words for tavern. There was, of course, the word tavern um, from the Latin taberna for a, a, a small establishment for drinking wine. Uh, public house, this is a, a designation from Britain where homes would get a license to serve and sell food and drinks and lodging uh, retail. Um, and they would get a certificate to become a public house, but it was just an ordinary house, but it uh, had a license to be a public house. They were called ordinaries, which was a reference to the, the ordinary was a type of meal that was served at a fixed price at a, at a fixed time of day. They were known as grog shops, a reference to grog, a, a type of watered down rum cocktail. They were referred to as slog shops, inns, tippling houses, dram houses, ale houses, exchanges, wagon stands, many, many words, a rich vocabulary for how to discuss taverns. So in a way, taverns were the social networks of the day. And because of that, they found themselves at the center of major political and military moments during the Revolutionary War. And in several cases, entire towns grew up around once isolated taverns along postal roads. And the towns eventually took the name of the tavern that it grew around. And this is the case with at least two examples that I know of off the top of my head. In Pennsylvania, there's a town called Unicorn and another town called Red Lion. And they take their name from the tavern that was at one point in time, the only building in that area. Uh, at this point though, I do think it's good to not romanticize taverns too much, especially the country taverns were notoriously ill-equipped. They were famous for having spoiled food and dirty conditions were very common. Fleas were common. Strangers had to share beds and chamber pots. Um, and even, this was true even for wealthy people, even a, a George Washington type character would be expected to share his bed with passerbys um, as private hotel rooms were still decades away from being uh, invented. So again, this is a land rich, but cash poor society lacking basic amenities, make, making the tavern a uh, essential a warm place, a place where most of town's businesses, uh, business went through, uh, but also uh, fundamentally primitive to today's standards. So I also wanna bring up a couple fun facts about taverns that folks may not be aware of. First off is that the Declaration of Independence was drafted at the Philadelphia's Indian Queen Tavern by Thomas Jefferson. The U.S. Marine Corps was founded at another Philadelphia tavern known as the Tun Tavern, uh, long since demolished, but there is a plaque marking where it once stood. Uh, the Boston Tea Party, the famous protest against Monopoly, was uh, the um, plan from the Green Dragon Tavern, also tragically no longer with us. Um, another fun fact is that um, Francis Hopkins, um, the gentleman who actually designed the American flag for the Navy. He, did, he didn't make it, of course. He, he designed it, though. Um, and he designed it for the, Ameri the United States Navy. But the Continental Congress liked it so much, they, they used it to be the, the nation's flag. And for payment, all he asked for was a cask of wine for designing it. Um, he must have made some powerful enemies in the Continental Congress, though, since they stiffed him and they, they never gave him his payment. He went to the grave bitter about it. Another fun fact that's interesting about the role of alcohol and the American Revolution, also closely related to taverns, is that the first British tax wasn't on paper or stamps or tea. It was way back in 1733 via the Molasses Act. And it was a tax on the import of non-British sugar and sugar products, including especially rum and the molasses 
uh, American colonists needed to distill their own rum. And this was because British sugar barons had tried to force colonists to buy their more expensive products instead of the cheaper French sugar products by making the French sugar artificially more expensive using import duties. And John Hancock uh, made his fortune smuggling this cheap French molasses for New England rum stills. And that became a major part of his early fortune. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the founding fathers and alcohol. This is one of the funnest components about this. And for this, I'll, I'll put up a, a little bit of slides um, and we will we'll go into slides from here on out. So let me do the screen share again and we'll go to the keynote presentation. And then we'll go to the, the founding fathers. So drunkenness was frowned upon during the colonial era and the revolutionary era, but teetotaling was nearly unheard of. Alcohol was universally understood, misunderstood, to be something that was essential for good health. And to give you an example of how much Americans drank during this time, it's estimated that adult Americans drank 3.7 gallons of pure alcohol in 1776 versus just 2.3 gallons today. And that 1776 figure would make Americans the second drunkest nation on earth today. Behind Lithuania, make of that what you will, Americans today rank around 25th in terms of alcohol per capita consumption. So we've taken a step down. And I will mention at this point though that the, the 1776 figure was relatively mild in terms of alcohol consumption for the near future. American alcohol consumption peaks in the 1820s in the Jacksonian era when you take the, the common traditions of drinking alcohol throughout the day that the colonists had. But then in the eight, by the 1820s, the Americans had swapped out the relatively low alcoholic drinks like cider, um, or small beer and spruce beer, and we're just drinking straight whiskey at every single meal of the day. And the, the alcohol uh, per gallon consumption, uh, per capita consumption of alcohol by the 1820s had grown to uh, a pretty horrific scales. But back to the, call, to the founding fathers, John Adams was famous for drinking a tankard of hard cider at breakfast every morning. Thomas Jefferson uh, tried to combat public uh, drunkenness by making wine cheaper. It was during Jefferson's presidency that whiskey overtook rum as the spirit of choice in America. The price of whiskey was plummeting due to increased corn and rye production in uh, the frontier territories in the West. And uh, Thomas Jefferson decided the best way to, to, to compete with whiskey was to make wine cheaper. Um, it may have helped that Jefferson was one of the only and largest wine producers in America at the time at Monticello. So take his reasoning with the grain of salt. But, uh, and then of course you have Ben Franklin, um, America's most famous bon vivant at the time. He encouraged people to take a drink of rum before public speaking, which I thought was really funny. Um, Franklin might be the most misquoted man in American history. Um, when you go to Philadelphia today, any gift shop will have t-shirts and posters of the famous kind of frat room quote of Franklin saying, in wine there is wisdom, in beer there is freedom, in water there is bacteria. <laughs> but uh, Franklin uh, did not say that. Um, he, he died about a hundred years before bacteria was invented, but he did say something similar, perhaps, um, in, an on, in a letter to the French economist Andre Morlet in 1779. Um, it was a slightly more poetic phrase. He wrote to his friend, behold the rain which descends from heaven upon our vineyards. There it enters the roots of the vines to be changed into wine a constant proof that God loves us and loves to see us happy. Washington uh, 
after his presidency, became the largest whiskey distiller in America. And by 1798, he was producing 13,000 gallons of whiskey at Mount Vernon, um, which he got some criticism for when he was president. He passed the, um, the whiskey tax on distilled spirits to help pay revolutionary war debts. And it was a regressive tax that punished smaller uh, whiskey producers more than it did larger whiskey producers. And he was definitely a large one. But taverns themselves, that's alcohol, the founding fathers and alcohol. Now let's talk about taverns. Taverns were controversial. A number of tavern, the number of taverns in the United States, or excuse me, early colonial America, began to explode during the 1750s. And the reason was, was that they were needed to help raise revenue for colonial governments who did not want to raise taxes on the public. So they could instead raise revenue through licensing fees of taverns. And number, uh, John Adams and even Ben Franklin took to writing polemics and printing them in various newspapers that taverns had become nurseries of idleness and debauchery and a pest to society. So let's explore some of the surviving taverns today. This one pictured here is Francis Tavern in New York City. It was established in 1762, though the building itself dates to 1719 uh, and was a home first, and it was converted to a tavern after it was sold to a gentleman by the name of Samuel Francis, who converted it um, in 1762 to the Queen's Head Tavern. This tavern uh, was the site of the lesser famous New York Tea Party. In 1774, the New York Sons of Liberty discovered that the ship London was carrying tea. Um, and when it docked in New York Harbor, uh, the Sons of Liberty escorted the captain to France's tavern where he confessed to be holding contraband tea, uh, after which uh, he was held and detained in the tavern while the tea was tossed overboard by the Sons of Liberty. And uh, I'm assuming several folks on here have probably seen Hamilton. There is a part in Hamilton where Hamilton uh, goes out with the Sons of Liberty in New York and he steals the British cannons. Um, and Hamilton volunteers for this, and it was a dangerous mission. And the, new, the British responded to this at the time by firing cannon, a barrage of cannon from the HMS Asia, a ship of the line that was anchored in the harbor at the time, at the city. And one of the cannonballs ripped through the roof of Francis Tavern, uh, causing uh, major destruction destroying the roof, thankfully no one was injured. And then this next slide is a picture of the inside of Francis Tavern, uh, the main dining hall. During the Revolutionary War, Samuel Francis was believed um, to have worked in the tavern as a spy. And it was long, it's long been rumored that Francis was possibly involved in uncovering an assassination attempt on George Washington. Uh, we don't know for sure the details, but we do know that after the war, Congress awarded Francis with 2,000 pounds and Francis became Washington's personal chef. Congress also leased his tavern to become the first location of the United States Departments of War, State, and Treasury. So this tavern here was the very first Pentagon uh, if you can believe it, and several other important uh, U.S. departments when the cap before the capital was moved to uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, Francis Tavern, however, is probably most famous for being the location of George Washington's farewell speech on November 25th, as the last British troops were leaving the United States from Manhattan on evacuation day. Washington rode triumphantly into town, culminating in a high tension dinner with his generals who had recently learned uh, the pensions Congress had promised would not ever materialize, which was leading to whispers of insurrection. 
And according to firsthand accounts, Washington pulled out a letter from his pocket and surprisingly pulled out glasses to read, remarking that he had not only grown old, but almost blind in the service of his country. He apologized for failing to get Congress to act, and he urged uh, his officers to, uh, to move on uh, with their careers and their lives um, and cried during the address. And folks there moved and remarked uh, that they were moved to silence and an appreciation for Washington's service. And then just a few miles north of New York City is another great preserved tavern called the Old 76 House. This is in Tappan, New York, established 1755. And Tappan is nestled along the Hudson River. And during the war, this gave it extraordinary military value. The British had a plan to control the Hudson and in doing so, control New England which made the Hudson River one of the bloodiest era, areas of the war. And so on so September 22nd, 1780, Benedict Arnold met with the British spymaster, John Andre at night in the woods, not far from here. And during this exchange, Arnold formally sells out the United States for a brigadier generalship and 20,000 pounds. The British would in turn get a detailed plan of the West Point Fortress that Arnold was charged with defending and assurances from Arnold that he would surrender without a fight. Andre's ship, however, came under attack. Um, Arnold, uh, Benedict Arnold had to provide John Andre with clothes and a passport to get over land past American soldiers. However, Andre ran into plain closed guards and confessed that he was British in the hopes that they too were British. They were American, they searched him and found that the West Point plans were in his boot. Uh, this photo here is from the inside now of the tavern. That's the original bar post uh, along which George Washington is presumed to have leaned across at one point. Um, but Arnold, or excuse me, but John Andre was imprisoned at the tavern um, and questioned. And the local commander uh, in this part of Tappan was on patrol. So the acting commander at the time decided to relocate Andre to the nearest general, which of course was Benedict Arnold at West Point. So you can imagine uh, John Andre was feeling rather lucky. But soon after he went on his way to, to Benedict Arnold, the local, local commander did return. He heard the story and immediately suspected Arnold to be in on the plot somehow. So he sent men to retrieve Andre and bring him back to the tavern. Uh, but word got out that Andre was captured at which Andre, uh, excuse me, at which Benedict Arnold famously left his wife uh, while eating breakfast with his fellow uh, so, uh, uh, army officers. And he escaped narrowly during breakfast um, and made it to British lines. Andre, by the way, was tried at the tavern. He was imprisoned at the tavern, he was tried, and he was given a spy's punishment, which was death by hanging off of a tree behind the tavern. Another great tavern here that I'm gonna show is the Griswold Inn, which has a fascinating story. It's known as the Grizz by locals. It opened in 1776, and it served as uh, the workers uh, a lodging place for the workers in Essex bu uh, bustling shipyards, uh, not far from the tavern itself on the, the shoreline. During the war of 1812, British forces destroyed the shipyard and marched into town and stole the inn's booze. This is a great photo on the inside. Uh, they have a holiday tree there year round. You could tell I was there around Halloween because the, the tree is all orange. Um, but this is the inside of the original tap room it was built in 1738, so it's much older than the actual tavern. Um, and the, the, root, the tap room was built as Connecticut's first schoolhouse. And in 1801, it was rolled down Main Street by a team of oxen. And if you could see closely, you'll notice this curved ceiling. And when you go there, you can look closely and you can see the original horsehair and clamshell plaster. 
It's original and it's still intact. And the Inn claims to have the largest private collection of maritime artwork in the US. And if you go in, you'll believe them. It completely covers the dining part of the area, uh, which is behind this photograph. Um, and they have a large collection of revolutionary era muskets. And one of the most incredible finds that I found at any tavern uh, that I visited was a note that was hidden in the barrel of one of their muskets that was uncovered by a university um, uh, expert who was looking over the, um, the collection of weapons for proper restoration and display. And they found a note and the note read, my dear son, Jared, I send you this, my gun. Do not handle it in fun, but with it make ye British run, join ye ranks of Washington. And when our independence is won, we will take a drink of good old rum. And this poem is signed by a John Francis Putnam on July 7th, 1776. Very possible they had not even heard about the Declaration of Independence by this time. And the note itself is framed on the wall for all to see, it's a great find. Another lovable tavern that folks can still visit today is the Mill Street Hotel and Tavern in Mount Holly, New Jersey. Uh, it was established in 1723. And you might have noticed that all the taverns before seem to be pretty well restored and rather fancy. The Mill Street is not one of these taverns. Uh, it, is, it has a squealy door alarm. It's the only tavern with beer neons. You can see Budweiser and Bud Light, but it still has rooms. It's original rooms for short-term rentals up on the top. And actually you can see a gentleman there. He was a tow truck driver. He politely asked if he should move while I was taking photographs. And I demanded that he stay in place for the authenticity because the authenticity of this tavern has remained virtually unchanged. It's, that is to say, its social function has remained virtually unchanged since it first opened. It's a place to get drinks in the neighborhood and it's a place to get short-term lodging if you need it. That said, uh, it also has some deep revolutionary history in its own right. Early during the war, the British captured New York and they pushed Washington across the Delaware River out of New Jersey and into Pennsylvania. And to keep them there, the British and Hessian troops established defenses at Mount Holly here and at Trenton, New Jersey, not far away, to hold the line and keep Washington in Pennsylvania throughout the winter. And in Mount Holly, British officers used this tavern as their local headquarters. And then on December 22nd and 23rd in 1776, American forces attacked the British position in Mount Holly in a strategic bid to draw re Hessian reinforcements away from Trenton. And the plan worked and it set the stage for Washington's dramatic crossing of the Delaware River to attack the remaining Hessian forces the morning after Christmas. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about this one, one of my favorites. This is the White Horse Tavern in Newport, Rhode Island, established 1673. This is for all intents and purposes, the oldest bar in the United States. It was built in, it was actually built in 1652 and converted to a tavern in 1673, shortly after which the, uh, that pitched roof was added. So it's looked virtually the same ever since. This building also served as the de facto Rhode Island Capitol building, housing the Rhode Island General Assembly, criminal court and city council for years. And during the 17th and 18th century, I love this, Rhode Island was a hot spot for piracy that they nicknamed it Rogue Island. Captain Kidd is believed to have been a, a past customer here. And it was actually at one point owned by the former pirate William Mays during his retirement in, uh, between 1702 and 1730. And then of course, lastly, uh, I have to mention Longfellow's Wayside Inn. Uh, this tavern opened in 1716 as the tavern of David Howe, whose house was on the Boston Post Road, uh, which back then were the highways, the freeways, 
Uh, instead of gas stations and convenience stores, there were taverns along these post roads. And I gotta say the Wayside Inn probably has the best kept records of any colonial tavern uh, that I have found. This tavern passed to House son, House son Ezekiel in 1748, and Ezekiel renamed it the Red Horse Tavern. And then of course, on uh, April 19th, 1776, Ezekiel joined a company of Minutemen and marched six miles to support the colonists in Lexington and Concord and fought British in skirmishes, skirmishes back to Boston that day. Uh, Ezekiel went on to fight under Benedict Arnold at Saratoga, where he received a wound he believed was fatal, so he sent his pocket watch and sword back to his family. Uh, he survived, and both today the watch and the sword are on display at Wayside's Inn. You should go check it out. Uh, in 1861, the Red Horse Tavern entertained its most famous guest, of course, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Tough to relate today, but poets were like the rock stars of the day, and New England was definitely the mecca for it. And Longfellow was so taken by the tavern's history and charm that he used it as the inspiration for Tales of a Wayside Inn, the famous book of poems that includes Paul Revere's ride. And before long, people came by looking for Longfellow's Wayside Inn, and the owners, noting a good commercial opportunity when they spotted one, decided to uh, appropriately rename the tavern to Longfellow's Wayside Inn. And then, of course, the tavern uh, had aged poorly, but was purchased by Henry Ford in 1923, who restored it to its current and former glory. So to wrap up a couple things on where taverns are today, um, I'll bring up this tavern here. This is a etching of the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston, Massachusetts. This is where the Sons of Liberty were founded. This served as their uh, headquarters. This is where the, um, the Boston Tea Party was planned, where the, the concepts of liberty trees, liberty poles were founded. Um, Daniel Webster called the Green Dragon Tavern the headquarters of the American Revolution. But sadly, like most colonial taverns in urban centers especially, uh, this tavern was destroyed um, by fire um, or they were torn down to make way for new real estate development, which is why the best preserved taverns today happen to not be in the famous colonial cities like Boston and Philadelphia, but outside in rural areas, located on the old postage roads, like the Wayside Inn. Um, many of them went into disrepair after railroads were built and displaced the, uh, the post roads as the main corridors of commerce. The freeways then displaced the railroads uh, as areas of commerce, but many taverns have reinvented themselves as country getaways. So with that, um, I'll close here. This last image is of the City Tavern in Philadelphia. It was established in 1773, and it was destroyed in the 1850s to make way for fancier hotels. This was at one point the, the finest tavern in the Americas, but it was uh, soon uh, eclipsed by hotels during the 1810s and 20s. However, it's a good example of, a, of, of how taverns can be faithfully restored and rebuilt. This one was rebuilt uh, in 1976 by the National Park Service in time for America's bicentennial. And so with that, I will stop sharing and I am happy to uh, one again, thank everybody for the invitation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Adrian. I really appreciated that. Um, I, you know, since we haven't been able to travel, um, some of those photos, I have a lot to add to my itinerary, as I'm sure others here do as well. And I was really excited during this um, that the chat was lighting up with comments and commentary. Um, and I think that the first question for you is, what is the origin of the actual name Kuwu? You talk about it on page 43 of your book. Um, but the name is very interesting. And I know we have some 
Wayside Inners on our, our page. You can probably add to the chat too. Oh, you know, well, at that, if we're talking about the etymology of the coup, I'm going to defer to the Wayside Inn experts. I, I want to hear from them. So I know that our innkeeper, Steve Pickford, is on. Steve, I don't know if you know, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to type into the chat the answer to that, you know, I've heard a lot of different things. I've heard coo as in cow, um, but I just, I don't want to steer anyone wrong, no pun intended. <laughs> so we can also find that out um, and send that out to people as well. Um, if, if we do not know that. Um, okay, so um, the next question is, what is the oldest tavern in San Francisco? Ah, a controversial question. So the oldest tavern in San Francisco is often incorrectly uh, ascribed to a place called simply The Saloon. It's a great bar in North Beach. Um, it's a fantastic saloon, I, so I definitely don't want to dismiss it. It's often said, though, that the saloon survived the great 1906 earthquake and fire, and they even have a plaque on the wall saying that they did, with a fantastic tale about firefighters uh, putting out the flames of the, of the hotel, uh, of the saloon, in order to uh, establish credit, shall we say, with the... Um, the ladies who worked upstairs for later on. Um, tragically, uh, this uh, did not happen. There are photographs of the lot and it's just completely destroyed by the fire. So it did not survive. So the current saloon that you see was built in 1907 and there are building permits that again confirm that it was built in 1907. However, that means that the oldest saloon tavern in San Francisco is called the Old Clam House. It's on Bayshore Boulevard. It's far from downtown and therefore far from the destruction of the 1906 earthquake. And it was built in 1861 during the Lincoln administration. Um, and it was a on the, the stagecoach road between San Francisco and San Jose, where you could get an oyster and a steam beer, uh, still a popular San Francisco type of beer um, for about five cents. So great question. What is a steam beer? How do you, what do you, is it warm? Well. <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a, it's an ale that is cooled using in tanks up on the roof uh, using steam from the, the ocean breeze. So mm. in the, in the late 19th century, there was a, a, the brewing district in San Francisco just had steam emanating all over the place from the beer, uh, cooling at various stages of its production. Anchor steam beer is probably the most famous brand today. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from Izzy. What is your favorite tavern and why is it your favorite? Oh, that's, it's like picking your favorite child. Um, I'm going to say there's, there's, um, they all provide something different, but there are a couple standouts. Um, I'm not just brown nosing to my host, but the Longfellow's <laughs> Wayside Inn absolutely has to rank as one of the best colonial taverns in the United States. Uh, the, the bar room is expertly preserved. The, uh, if the, the post and beam ceilings, the, the rough wood floors, the grounds are beautifully kept. Um, there are other buildings associated with the tavern um, that are also beautifully kept. So it's really a more of a, it's probably the most immersive experience that you can get at a colonial tavern. I will say the, um, the White Horse Tavern in Ro Providence, Rhode Island, the oldest bar in America is very, very cool. Uh, it is today a farm to table kind of fine dining restaurant. So, you know, the rough edges have been sanded off a long time ago. This is a place where you go for anniversaries and whatnot. Um, and it, again, it's beautifully preserved. The ceilings are low on those cold winters. It's very, very cozy. And then I do have a soft spot for the Mill Street Hotel and Tavern. It's a gritty place. The inside of the tavern is not, uh, has not been restored. The outside looks very original but the inside looks like it was you know, gutted in the 1950s. 
but it still serves the same purpose. You know, it's not a fine dining restaurant. It's not a place where, you know, you dress nicely. It's a gritty local place, which is what I think it always has been. So for that reason, I think it deserves special recognition too. Great. Right. Um, and then we have another question. What object did you see on your tavern journeys that was the most evocative? Oh, what object? Okay. Um, so you went into the question. collections? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the um, Ezekiel Howe's uh, sword and uh, stopwatch at the Wayside Inn was very cool. Um, the um, George Washington's punch bowl at the Francis Tavern was pretty cool to check out. It at, was covered in all this masonry uh, design work. And so the second and third stories of the Francis Tavern are today is a museum. Um, and it's arranged so that you can look like, you know, you can walk through what it looked like when it was the war department um, and whatnot. And, um, you know, when the, the first time I had a rum punch, I was in college and it just seemed like this horrible hangover, um, just waiting to happen. And it was rum mixed with a bunch of sugar. And I thought, you know, who in God's name invented this? Little did I know I was participating in a very authentic ritual going back hundreds of years by drinking rum communally out of a large bowl um, mixed with various sugars and fruit juices. So this is something the, the founding fathers did. And they would be presented punch in a bowl and they would bring their own uh, tankard with them and they would dip their own cup out of the, the punch bowl and that's how they would drink it. So it was kind of a communal thing and seeing Washington's punch bowl, also very cool. And, and uh, the Wayside Inn has the tradition of hanging the tankards on the old bar um, in our bar room. Um, a lot of punch in those Sally, cups. On that, on, that mo on that point, Sally, um, I didn't present it here on, this, on, this on my slide deck, but when I do these presentations in, in person, the resting slide while I'm getting ready is a shot of the tank from the roof, uh, the ceiling of your of the tavern. A very cool image. Yeah, we love that. <laughs> um, okay, do you have a favorite drink among the historical ones you may have tasted on your travels to all these taverns? Uh, yes, with a caveat that it's a horrible drink. It's my favorite because of how weird it is. It's just the weirdest drink. And that is the flip. Uh, the flip is a, um, it's, it's a great colonial drink because it highlights how the colonists thought of drinking as a calorie supplement. This was something they did to, to help feed themselves. You know, early in the colonial era, New York actually had a law against distilling wheat into whiskey because the wheat was needed for food. So early in colonial history, the colonists had it hard. Each winter, you know, it wasn't guaranteed that you were going to survive. So using alcohol as a calorie supplement was something that was a, a very common um, interpretation and accepted interpretation of what drinking should be. And that's really captured in the flip, which is about I might off the top of my head get the exact portions wrong, but it's basically something like this. On a stove top, you heat about 10 ounces of beer to steaming, but not boiling. And then in a, in a mixing cup, you beat an egg with about two ounces of cream, uh, an ounce and a half of rum, and about a tablespoon of molasses or brown sugar. Whip that up. Uh, and then when the beer is steaming, you froth the two, you mix them in two mixing cups until it's nice and frothy. And in the old days, you would take an iron uh, loggerhead and plunge it into the drink to froth up the egg finally. Um, today, this you can substitute the cream and the egg with eggnog. And the flip is widely believed to be the, on, you know, the, the first stump on the family tree of cocktails on the way to our traditional eggnog cocktail today. 
Um, but I make one every year around Christmas and I regret it, but I still do it <laughs> because I'm a sucker for authentic pain. <laughs> but it's a, it is by far my favorite because the story is great. The founding fathers wrote about it in letters. John Adams mentions it when he goes to parties or on the holidays. Uh, so it's a great drink. In terms of actually like enjoying the drink, um, I think the Stone Fence is a pretty good drink. That's one with um, uh, uh, rum and hard cider. Pretty tough to, to get that wrong. Adds a little sweetness and kick to hard cider. So that's a good one. Great, you'll have to come out in December and, and we'll maybe do another program with you <laughs> making those. Um, do you happen to know how old McSorley's is in New York City, did you say? Um, I did not cover McSorley's. Um, okay. I'll get the date exactly wrong, but it's about 1855. Oh, yep, somebody's saying 1854. Somebody answered. Okay. That. So 1854, 1854. Okay. Um, so, um, outside of the perimeter of this book. Okay. Great bar though. If you're in Manhattan, I highly recommend it. Um, how many of the 171 surviving tavern buildings currently serve as taverns? Did I get that right? Um, I break this down in the book and I think I actually broke it down um, early on. Here, here it is. So 171 survive. 72 today are bars and rest and or restaurants. So some are only bars, some are restaurants that don't have bars, but you can order booze. So 72 is some combo of bar restaurant. There are 49 museums, 36 inns. And some of those inns you can get drinks too, but it's not a big part of the, the service. Um, 12 are community buildings. So, you know, there were a couple that were, um, you know, the local meeting hall. So that's pretty cool. Um, I mentioned there's one Starbucks and one yoga studio. So not all of them have been preserved with authenticity in mind. And I'll also add that there are several hundred original tavern buildings in addition to these that have been incorporated into people's homes. And I haven't listed those in the book because you know, for obvious reasons, privacy reasons. Okay. Um, we have another question. Did any taverns make or process alcohol on their premises or was it mostly brought in similar to breweries today? There definitely would have been some that made the, um, their alcohol on site, particularly the country taverns. Again, country taverns were very self-sufficient um, in New England, they did a lot of their own distilling, uh, mostly of rum, uh, mostly using imported molasses. So there was a lot of that. Um, as far as which ones to, um, surviving today brewed their own, I'm not sure. I'm going to guess, though, that the Mill Street Hotel and Tavern probably did because it was formerly known as the Tun Tavern. And a ton, T-U-N, is an ancient form reference to a volume of alcohol. And a ton, again, I'll, don't quote me on it, but a ton was about, I think, 500 gallons. Um, so a tavern that was named the Ton Tavern typically meant that that tavern was licensed to have one ton of alcohol on site. And then every now and then you come across a three ton tavern, which would have been a big party. Okay. The next question relates to the making of the book. How long did it actually take to research and then to travel to all of the taverns? Uh, it took me about a year, uh, start to finish. First thing I did was I had to, starting from scratch, I just had to make sure that there were enough taverns that were still standing. To make a, a to make a book um, even you know possible, and so I was able to to quick pretty quickly figure out that these twenty one in particular, since they are the, with the exception of the Mill Street Hotel and Tavern, which doesn't even have a website, that one took some <laughs> some digging, but um, most of these taverns are pretty well known. Um, you can find them if you look at a historical society site. Um, 
it the the most difficult part was finding all of the surviving ones. Um, again, 171. So what I ended up doing was there was a book that was published in the 1920s called Early American Inns and Taverns. And if anyone really wants to geek out on this stuff, uh, this is a great resource. Uh, it was by an author named Elise Lathrop. And she lists taverns in, uh, in the early American states, not just the original 13 colonies, but some of the first westward expansion states. Um, and a, a couple anecdotes about them where she had them. And it's done by state. And she lists about 1,500 taverns and inns in this book. She doesn't give the address. She just gives the city. And this book was written in 1920. Um, and without any indication of whether or not the tavern was even still standing. Many of the taverns whose stories she was telling were of taverns that had been long destroyed by the time she wrote the book in the 1920s. So I digitized her index of 1500 taverns and went through sometimes using Google Street View to go through the, the old colonial downtown areas and to see if where she described it, if there was an old building. And if there was, you know, investigate to see what, you know, what it, if there was a tavern there. Um, so that was what became kind of the foundation of what I looked for. So between that um, and the due diligence paid to building out the, the at least Lathrop list, the other part of, of the research was going through the digital archives of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Ben Franklin, and um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, if I didn't mention that already. But luckily, Mount Vernon, uh, University of Virginia, University of Massachusetts um, has done a great job at digitizing these records. And you can keyword search them for things like tavern. Um, and you can see immediately in what context the founding fathers were writing about taverns or different types of alcohol. Thank you. You know, I think I've come to the end of all of the questions. Does anybody have another question they want to sneak in at the last minute here? I'm not. I'm not seeing any coming through yet. Um, so I just want to thank you, Adrian, and I want to thank everybody who's been on the Zoom call with us. Um, just uh, please do watch our social media and our website for upcoming events. We have a few um, themed dinners uh, coming up too um, and dates to be determined. So we'll be announcing those. But um, once again, when you're able to move about the country, come look at all these taverns and uh, thank you again.